Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to a new biochemistry video. In the past video, we went through the general biochemistry cycle and we concluded that we get food from molecules of life. We break them into smaller units and then reassemble them back to the same molecules but in two forms, functional and structural. We utilize signaling molecules in addition to energy molecules to build the structure which is the cell. And once the cell is old, we recycle it back to the original molecules by breaking it down or by excreting waste. Our focus will start on analyzing each of these molecules of life from the start point to all their possible destination or end points under a functional or structural group. Now each of those three molecules of life have a major distinctive function over the rest. For instance, proteins are the most abundant both signaling and structural molecules, leaving nothing but energy for the carbohydrates. The distinction is that carbohydrates provide instant source of energy right after, after eating, while the lipids act as a store for energy on the long term when the body is deprived of food. It is important to note that proteins can even serve for energy production in the starvation cases by mobilizing amino acids and those amino acids can either enter the carbohydrate pathway known as glucogenic amino acids or enter the lipid uh, dependent energy producing pathway known as ketogenic amino acid. I hope by now I have provided enough proof already for the reason why proteins are the most important group of uh, molecules and that's why they are chosen to be discussed first. As we all know, proteins are made up of a combination of amino acids that must be understood individually at a chemical level in order to make sense of the final structure and function of the protein. As you can see over here, the protein is folded and this is only a result of the complex interaction between chemically distinct amino acids. First, we need to note some facts about amino acids. A total of 20 amino acids are needed by our body and those are abbreviated commonly by the first three letters with the exception of asparagine, aspartate, glutamine, and glutamate. As you can see over here, those each, of the, each pair has the same first three letters. So what we do is that for asparagine and glutamine, we give them the letter N instead. Also, isoleucine and tryptophan don't follow the first three letters. Uh, in tryptophan, you can see that it starts with TRY, which is similar to tyrosine. That's why we choose P to, to differentiate. We get amino acids into our body through two ways. One is the direct uh, breakdown products from protein in the food. The second one is by formation within the body, and this is by two ways, either by chemical conversion from essential to non-essential, or by utilizing the intermediates of the energy producing pathway. Just like anything in medicine, there are exceptions. You see those amino acids that are labeled by an arrow, those are also considered as conditionally essential. And what we mean by that is that at certain stages, our body requires those amino acids in excess from food also. A typical example is arginine, which is a basic component of the DNA. You know, DNA is required at higher levels when we are growing, especially in children. And in that case, our body is no longer able to form enough arginine. So we need extra amount from the food to come in. That's why it's called conditionally essential, only when our body is at fast rate of growth, a condition. Now recall we mentioned that amino acids can enter the energy producing pathway either through the carbohydrate energy producing pathway or the uh, lipid producing pathway as glucogenic amino acid or ketogenic amino acid. You can see over here the ones that start with L, leucine and lysine are the ketogenic amino acids. As for histidine, methionine, and valine, those are the glucogenic amino acids. I bet you're asking now, what about the rest? Well, the rest of the essential amino acids can be both glucogenic or ketogenic. Now, I bet you're wondering, how is it possible to memorize these names in the first place? For me personally, I use a not very fancy way. As you can see here, uh, under the non-essential, it all starts either with A, G, or C, or S, leaving only P and T letters in, in common between non-essential and essential. While on the essential side, the letters are H, L, M, and V. Those letters are not repeated on the other side. 
So only PT is left out. How I remember it is that the shorter names, proline and tyrosine, are on the non-essential side, and the longer names, phenylalanine, threonine, and tryptophan, are under the essential. Now that we're done with stating the amino acid background and facts, let's start with the real biochemistry. This is the chemical structure of any amino acid in our body, and I would like to emphasize the word in our body because of the charges that you see over here and that we will discuss in details in the next slide. We have the amino acid has a central alpha carbon that has a tendency for four bonds. The first bond, by definition of an organic compound, is a hydrogen bond. The second bond is to an amine group, and the third bond is to a carboxylic acid group. And I guess from here you can tell why we have the name amino acid, the combination. And the fourth bond is a variable R group or side chain, which gives a, gives a, the rise to the different 20 amino acids. The first carbon-hydrogen bond is table and thus unreactive, while the bond to the carboxylic acid and the amino group, both of these are considered fairly unreactive except in two cases. It depends on the pH for its ability to form ions, and they are involved in the formation of a peptide bond. Now moving on to the R group or side chain, we said it is variable. It has a choice of being either a hydrophobic group or a hydrophilic group, that is water-loving or water-hating. Of course, the water-loving has a tendency to form ions. We'll discuss each of those four points in details next. So we mentioned the amino group and carboxylic group are fairly unreactive, except in two cases. The first was the pH. So what you see here, the central amino acid version has a positive sign on the left and the negative sign on the right and this is what I emphasized which is specific in our body. You know that our body pH is neutral, it is around 7. And in a neutral pH, the carboxylic acid and the amine group tend to express their themselves naturally. Carboxylic acid is an acid. Any acid has a tendency to donate its proton or the hydrogen, while the amino group by nature it is a base and has a tendency to accept a hydrogen at a neutral pH. What happens if the pH became acidic or lower? The definition of a lower pH is having more hydrogen ions. So if you have more hydrogen ions, you need to buffer those hydrogen ions. So the carboxylic acid, which has a minus sign, is forced to accept a hydrogen on its side. And this is the form at low pH. Now on the other extreme, the right side, if you have a high pH, that is you have, it is a basic uh, solution, you have low hydrogen, the NH3 in from for buffering purposes will lose its hydrogen and this is the form that you will have. Now if you look on the central form which is in our body you will find that we have a positive sign on a side and a negative sign on the other side. This gives the image that we have an anion or a negatively charged ion on one side and the cation on the other side while the net charge is zero, so we call this a hybrid ion or a zwitter ion that gives you an image of a positive ion on the side and a negative ion on the side while the net charge is zero. Now the levels by which the NH3 tends to lose its hydrogen and the carboxylic acid tends to gain hydrogen are known as pK1 and pK2. These are the pHs by which the carboxylic acid and the amine group tend to either gain or lose their hydrogens. And now we move on to the second type of chemical interaction between amine group and carboxylic acid, and that is the peptide bond. As you can see over here, we have the nitrogen end and the carbon end, nitrogen end over here, while the carbon end on the other side. And one carboxylic end with the other nitrogen end form a bond, and they release a water along with. And this type of reaction is known as the condensation type of reaction. Det details about this reaction will be discussed when proteins are covered. Finally, we reached the last and most important group, the side chain. We mentioned earlier they are either hydrophobic, water-hating, or hydrophilic, water-loving. The question that should come next is, why do we need both water-loving and water-hating? You need to consider the two, those two points. We have 70% water in our body, so we need hydrophilic, they must be hydrophilic, the proteins. The second thing is that Proteins are mainly signaling molecules, are important in signaling, and signaling requires passage and interaction with the cell membrane, which is made up of lipid. And that's why we need also the hydrophobic group, which can interact with the lipid. 
just to complicate things a little bit more, the hydrophobic and hydrophilic uh, group are further subclassified. Hydrophobic is mainly formed by carbons and hydrogens, and it is subclassified into either chain structure or ring structure. And the chain is further subclassified into being simple, that is a straight chain or branched chain. While for the hydrophilic, it is further subclassified into uncharged group that has polar bonds, but it doesn't have any net charge. A basic group that has a positive charge and an acidic group that has a negative charge. The uncharged group are characterized by either one of three, a sulfur bond, a nitrogen bond, or a bond to a hydroxyl group. On the base, it specifically has an NH plus and acid, a carboxylic acid group. Before starting with the hydrophobic amino acids, I would like to note that the amino acids labeled with an asterisk refer to the essential amino acids, those that are required with, from food. And recall I mentioned that they are, uh, they all start with either uh, H, L, M, V, and for the P and T, the shorter words specifically. Second point that I need to emphasize is this blue box that is around the amino acid components, the carboxylic acid, the amino group, and the hydrogen bond. And this is for the purpose of uh, not confusing it with the side chain. Now moving on to the hydrophobic. The first group under hydrophobic was the chains. Chains are also known as aliphatic. The first group under chains was, if you recall, was the simple chains. Simple chains are the first two amino acids mentioned here, the glycine and alanine, as obvious in their structures. Now, the special characteristic about simple proteins is that they are very easily folded when they are within a protein due to their small size. And if you look at glycine specifically, its side chain is only a hydrogen bond, making it the simplest amino acid in our body. Now moving on to the second group, which are the branched amino acids, valine, leucine, and isoleucine. Now the characteristic of those is exactly the opposite to the simple chains. The branched chains are very hard to fold when they are within a protein due to their bulky structure. Now moving to the last amino acid proline. Proline is considered a very special or exceptional case. If you look at the um, side chain, you will realize that it binds to the base, main amino uh, group in the amino acid. And this is known as secondary amino group. This doesn't happen in any other amino acid except for proline, making it a very special case. Why is it special? Because if you can imagine the proline trying to form a bond with uh, amino acid from the left and right, it will be forced to form an, a bond that is in the shape of a curve or a, an angle. And that is why proline are very specialized for forming kinks within any protein. Now moving on to the second group under hydrophobic or water-hating amino acids, the ring structures, also known as aromatic due to their smell. You will realize all of them have a ring structure within. Those are the phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan. Tyrosine is specialized for having a hydroxyl group also, and this hydroxyl, hydroxyl group has a tendency to acquire a negative charge at a pH of 10. That is why sometimes you might find tyrosine labeled as hydrophilic. For tryptophan, it has a nitrogen, additional nitrogen within its ring structure. Now moving on to the hydrophilic group. The first group under the hydrophilic is the uncharged amino acids that are uncharged yet polar due to the bond with a hydroxyl group, a sulfur group, or a nitrogen group. The first group, which have a bond with a hydroxyl group, the serine and the threonine, are specialized with one thing. Hydroxyl group has a tendency to bind to phosphate. And you might already know that the enzymes are either activated or inactivated by adding or removing a phosphate group. So usually in an enzyme, the site by which it is phosphorylated or dephosphorylated is at a, an amino acid that is serine or threonine. Now moving on to the second group, the cysteine and methionine have uh, one thing in common, which is a sulfur group. Cysteine specifically has a tendency when you have two cysteines within a protein, they can form a covalent strong bond by attaching two sulfides to each other, and this is known as a disulfide bond. Very strong bond, very specific. Now for methionine, just as we mentioned in tyrosine under the aromatic hydrophobic molecules, it could be mentioned under the hydrophilic, here we have the methionine. Because of its relative stability, sometimes you might find it mentioned under the hydrophobic group. 
So d don't let that confuse you. Now moving on to the last two groups, the asparagine and the glutamine. Both of them have one thing in common, they have an amino group and this amino group is not charged. Make sure to note that. One final point about glutamine, uh, it is the most abundant amino acid in our body. The second group under the water-loving amino acids are the basic positively charged group and those are the lysine, arginine and histidine. They are all characterized by having a positively charged amine group. And the common thing about all of those is that they are attractive to negative charge and specifically the DNA is very negatively charged and that's why you'll find that those three amino acids are highly involved with the DNA structure. The third and last group under the hydrophilic are the acidic negatively charged group that are characterized by having a negatively charged carboxylic acid. Before concluding, I would like to quickly summarize the key points about each amino acid. We had the first group that hated water, hydrophobic. The second group that loved water, hydrophilic. Starting with the hydrophobic first group are the chains. Glycine and alanine being the simple chains that are very easy to fold, glycine being the simplest, valine, leucine, and isoleucine, the branched that are hard to fold, and proline being the uh, special case which forms kinks in the structure. Proline is also known as an I minor group. And how I remember it is that proline has the side chain bonded to itself, to its amino group. That's why it's called an I, me, I minor group. Now moving on to the second group, which is the aromatic group or ring structures, phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan. Tyrosine had a hydroxyl group, tryptophan has a, had a nitrogen group. The rest only had carbons and hydrogens. Now moving on to the second group, which is the hydrophilic, we had the serine and threonine, uncharged and have a hydroxyl group that has a tendency to bind to phosphate, involved in activation of enzymes. Cysteine and methionine had a sulfur group, the cysteine, if you have two cysteines, they can form a very strong disulfide bond. Methionine is the very first amino acid in any protein ever. I didn't mention this earlier. Asparagine and glutamine had an amine group without a charge. And glutamine was the highest amino acid in quantity in our body. Second group under hydrophilic were those that have a charge, positive or negative. The positively charged are the lysine, arginine, and histidine. And those are the ones that love to interact with DNA and are involved in its structure. Aspartate and glutamate are the negatively charged acidic structures with a carboxylic acid attached. And by this, we are done with the, let's say, introduction of amino acids. I know it may be overwhelming due to a bunch of new terminology plus chemical structures, that need to be solidified in our memory before jumping into the medical high yield associations, including amino acid uh, final products and clinical relations that will be covered in the next video. If you found this video helpful, please support our channel by subscribing and liking this video.